Welcome to WHX Insights. My name is Peter Birch. This episode is powered by WHX Tech in partnership with Dell Technologies. Joining me today is Russell Main, healthcare lead for the Middle East at Dell Technologies. Hey, Russell, how are you going? Good, thanks, Peter. Nice to be here. I was worried if we didn't have a conversation with Russell here on the podcast, it wouldn't quite be, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the conversations here in Dubai. So it's great to have you here because I'm looking forward to unpacking you know, your knowledge and expertise of healthcare across different countries and regions and all of the emerging technologies. But I wanted to start firstly, because there's a lot of discussions uh, out in the industry about artificial intelligence, and we're all very excited, but there's different lenses you can take on that and different perspectives. And I wanted to first take the perspective of I guess the boardroom or the executives and um, you know, from your perspectives, what are the discussions about artificial intelligence in healthcare um, at the top or in the boardroom uh, at an executive level? Artificial intelligence is very much the buzzword at the moment. So a lot of the conversations in the boardroom are that we need to somehow implement AI to show that we're relevant, to show that we're up to date, to show that we're moving forward. That's as far as like the intellectual process goes into what is actually required. They just know that they, they need to show some sort of AI something, right? And really what there needs to be in the boardroom is a slightly deeper analysis as to what they actually are trying to achieve and how they're going to achieve that. Because most applications are, have got some component of AI in them already. It's just whether uh, it's how you are defining it. Okay, so for example, if you take uh, a hospital, most of them have got PAX providers have got AI modules that can fit in and help to read images anyway. So if you just take your current vendor and you're getting them to deploy that module into your workflow, you're essentially doing AI within your organization already, right? So that would be the easiest way of deploying AI. And that's that's something that boards really need to look at, like what, what the quick win would be, right? The other thing to do is maybe to bring a new logo into your environment and deploy AI in that way. The second tier, the, the, the slightly more difficult thing to do. And then finally, the very difficult thing to do would be to start from zero, say, well, we've got all this data, we want to be able to try to run, move through an LLM environment, and we want to get an outcome and try to do it completely themselves. And really, I think when boards think about what they need to do, they can see that they can deploy AI quite simply by leveraging the current vendors that they probably already have in their space. That's an interesting one, isn't it too? Because like you say, it can be quite the nebulous topic and uh, sometimes can be more for show and, and almost depending on the, the culture or the direction of the conversation, you almost lose sight onto why we're doing this in the first place. Um, as I'm thinking about discussions at a board level around AI, my mind immediately goes to governance um, and the the uh, controls or structure that you put around it. And I'd love to get your take on what you think good governance looks like in artificial intelligence, because sometimes some people could take the view of uh, governance means let's control it or constrain the innovation to um, put the barriers up so that it can, so we, we can um, define the thing. Others look at it in more of a, a guardrails definition or something. What's your kind of take? My take around governance is really that it's, it's fundamental to being able to move forward with AI without really clear governance around a project, it's going to fail, right? But that's not specifically around AI. It's always been there, right? It's always been there that if you don't have uh, strong governance around any kind of IT project, especially in the healthcare sector, that, that project's going to fail. So I don't think these are new concepts, really. It's just that, that probably historically, they haven't really been deployed very well anyway, you know? So what we really need to do is reinforce that AI projects are no different from other projects and they will fail for exactly the same reason as other projects have failed. You need governance, you need clinical engagement, you need clinical champions, you need executive buy-in, you need people to understand what the scope of the project is, you need clear start and finish uh, spaces, well-defined. That's immaterial of whether it's an AI project or a normal project, but I think that when you look at governance, that's that's key. And you speak about for safety, and I don't want to see uh, safety seen as something that's going to slow down a process and then you're going to move fast or you're going to move safe, right? I don't agree with that analysis. I think that you can move safe and fast, okay? But you need 
to be able to have the governance to be able to allow that to happen. If you don't have the governance, then you're going to get caught in this middle area where you've got different things pulling you in different directions. Mm. And some people say that, you know, the, the, the better the governance, the faster you can move and, and all these different analogies too. When I think about um, healthcare governance, compliance and, and the controls that exist around it, often those things, um, they're not a nice to have. It's, a, it's almost your, your minimum requirement because of, of the nature of the work we do. You, you've got to have it. But also, um, if you don't have it, then you lose trust and credibility. So I feel like trust is a really important um, point here too, because in order to have adoption and um, implementation of these tools, uh, the clinicians need to, to trust that uh, the thing's going to do what they think it's going to do. And the information, importantly, coming back is from a, a credible source. Um, uh, what's your take on, or how do you see, uh, I guess, leaders can, can instill trust within, um, I guess, the different stakeholders um, that might come in contact with emerging tools like artificial intelligence as they're being implemented? Gosh, that's quite a lot of stuff to kind of unpack, because I, I think that there, if we take the end user trying to use the solution, right, we can't default to the the idea that AI is required. So we we have an outcome that we'd like to see come to bear, right? AI isn't necessarily the answer to getting that outcome. Let's take a, a real example. Let's take a clinical documentation and the time that clinicians are spending on clinical documentation in the electronic health record. You can go down the pure AI, AI route and say, well, we need AI to somehow miraculously speed up this process, okay? Or you can look at it and say, why is it taking so long for clinicians to be able to use the system that was already in place effectively? If you have that inquiring mindset to start off with, you might realize that maybe they haven't been trained properly. Maybe the system hasn't been optimized correctly from a user interface perspective. Maybe they haven't really been brought into the decisions around the design and the workflow and the workflows don't actually work. And you need to start with that. So it's pre-AI, for example. You need to start with those processes, get them working so that the clinician can get brought into the continuous model of improvement that comes through. And then at some stage, you might find that there is an AI solution that fits into that workflow. But I think that too often, lots of... Uh, hospitals are looking at AI trying to fix a problem that's already in the system when they should really just take a step back and just go fix that problem. Mm. And I guess through historically the work you've done, but also the breadth of the reach of Dell technologies, you get very much a global perspective around this too. So um, do you find that these challenges and approaches are relevant just in this region or across the world? I think the challenge around effective governance is pan-universal, okay? Because you look at uh, most IT projects fail because of governance and executive buy-in. So I think that that's across the board. A lot of companies could do better is holding their vendors to account. If, when, when you're on the sales side, so I'm on the sales side, right? So you, you would essentially uh, say that every problem is surmountable. This is going to solve every problem that that person could have. But once the sales made in this and the solution has been implemented, how well are organizations that bought that solution actually holding that vendor to account? If you are selling an electronic health record and you're saying it's going to make dis uh, dispensing or prescription of medication safer, you need to be able to show that, right? And if the workflow becomes more complicated, then that hospital needs to work with that vendor to actually release those outcomes and release those use case outcomes that they're looking to achieve and not just take a step back and say, well, we, uh, we failed on implementation. Vendors need to be held to account to deliver the outcomes that they promised in the sale process. Just like when we sell infrastructure, we make promises around the speed, the compute power, the data deep duplication and things like that, we need to be able to show that that's happening on the back end once the system is being deployed as mm. well. I think then getting those expectations right up front and, and knowing that it's not, these types of things are not a set and forget type process. There's, I guess, at the rate of change of innovation and, and um, 
the 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 messiness, I guess, for want of a better term, of, of healthcare in that there's humans that are doing the caring and the um, processes change. So being able to have that dynamic partnership approach to these things sounds sounds important. Um, the uh, so one thing I'm hearing is that um, you brought up the example that sometimes these challenges where executives might be thinking, where can I deploy AI? Because I feel like that's something I need to do. Uh, sometimes AI may not even be the um, the right tool to use in that particular situation. But where do you start? If you were advising to a, a board or an executive or a leader that's looking at how can we effectively implement these things, where do you start? What I start with is I, I speak to them about governance. And I say, listen, you have to get this set up internally. There's an internal process that you need to do as an organization before you can start to move forward with AI, sorting out your clinical champions, sorting out who executive champion is going to be for the, pro for the program, really understanding what the, what the outcome is that you're looking to achieve. Set up the, even the mechanism of meetings, of change governance and things like that. You have to have all those sort of things in place. Then once those things are in place, then you can work out, well, what are we look, looking to achieve through this change governance model? Then you can start to move forward, whether it be through an AI implementation or through a change management implementation. Lastly, Russell, I'm thinking, you know, we've, one could be forgiven for always taking this top-down approach when thinking about at an executive level. Like, what does the executive need to do in order to tell people what to do and, and set the direction? Uh, but sometimes also change can be uh, driven from uh, the, the other way, so from patients and clinicians and those utilizing solutions. And I guess that's important too, to, to, to hold uh, leaders and executives to account almost. So um, how do you see uh, the role of, or, or how can clinicians and patients, you know, hold uh, executive or the, the, the leadership team to account when implementing some of these tools as well? Yeah, so the user experience for the patient is obviously very important as well. You know, that's one of the IHI quadruple aims, right? But equally, the user experience for the clinician using the system is important. And for that to be effective, you need uh, clinical change boards that are feeding information back up into the IT department. So you're having that input coming through, bubbling up to the top as to how the system needs to be modified to improve the workflow. And organizations that manage to get that right with a strong clinical change board that's really direct the way that the software applications are being deployed, that's the first point to be able to bring the, the information that's happening on the ground into the reality of what's happening across the enterprise. It's really difficult running an enterprise electronic health record, right? Because you make a change for one person, you're making a change for thousands of people. So you need this clinical change board to be in place to be able to work through the impact of a change and work through that if it's going to be net positive for the most users. Mm, 100%, I like that. Russell, I really appreciate you making the time for this discussion on WH Check Insights today. No worries. Thanks. Nice to meet you again, Peter. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of WHX Insights. This one was powered by WHX Tech in partnership with Dell Technologies. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify so you can catch all the conversations. My name's Peter Furch. I'll speak to you next time.